Okay, I think uh, we can kick off there. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Work event. Um, thanks, everyone, for your patience. Uh, slight delay in, in starting. Just a few words from my side. My name's uh, Kent Damien. I'm the chair of the LSE Alumni Association London. Very briefly, uh, this Future of Work event is a kickoff event in what we're hoping will be a series of events focusing on the future of work, jobs of tomorrow, the impact of AI, and the potential case for you know, universal basic income and related themes. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our very able chair, Ben Cumming who's going to uh, allow the panelists to introduce themselves and kick things off from there. So over to you, Ben. Thanks a lot, Ken. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Ben Cumming. As Ken points out, I'm going to be chairing this uh, session today on the future of work. Um, one quick note before we kick off, as I'm sure you'll all agree, the agenda for today is ambitious, to say the least. You could do five two-day conferences just on these topics. So if we don't get to everything, apologies. And if there's anything glaringly omitted, please feel free to stick it in the Q&A, which I'll be monitoring, and then Jerome will be sharing with us uh, at the end of the session. So hopefully we'll be able to address at least the lion's share of the topics. Um, promised. Uh, as Ken mentioned, I'm Ben Cumming. I'm the Communications Director at the Responsible Business Initiative for Justice, which works with business leaders to champion fairness and equality across systems of punishment and incarceration. But the reason why I'm here today is I used to work for many years at the think tank Chatham House, where I led on, amongst other things, the future of work, um, which is why I'm here and get to uh, share this wonderful event with all of you today. Um, I am a uh, lifelong generalist, but today, as ever, like any good generalist, I'm going to flatter myself by association with some real subject matter experts. Um, we've been asked to provide a prediction for the future of work. I have the uh, benefit of going first, so the field's wide open, and I'm going to pick a straightforward one, but nonetheless important one, which is the massive expansion of the gig economy uh, following the uh, economic disruption, not to mention the automation that is to come. Um, and I also think there's going to be a massive expansion of state level protections for those workers as they become an increasingly uh, vocal part of the political sphere. Over to you, James. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I'm James Pellat. I'm Director of Workplace and Innovation at Great Portland Estates. We're a FTSE 250 real estate investment trust, uh, which focuses on the ownership, management and development of property in central London. Um, my role is to look to the future and to challenge our product to make sure that we stay ahead of uh, emerging trends in terms of workplace and innovation and technology. Um, I think my prediction is that the importance of social value uh, and how uh, social mobility is going to become an overwhelming uh, voice uh, for the way that we consider how we conduct ourselves in business. And I do think that will have some physical representation in the way that we work to uh, handing over to the next panelist. Thanks very much, James. Deviani? Well, hi, I'm uh, Deviani Vaishyaklein. I'm the managing partner of a firm called the HR Tech Partnership, uh, which uh, does two things. We invest in AI-based HR tech startups. We also run a human capital digital innovation hub, which helps corporates experiment with uh, AI solutions around the future of work. And prior to that, I've been, I've been a chief human resource officer in large FTSE 100 businesses. And I guess my, my key prediction, it is, it's no surprise, is that virtual or remote working is here to stay. A recent survey by Gartner showed 74% uh, of CFOs believe that there will be some permanent level of remote working, ranging right from 5% to 100%. So a distributed workforce is now going to be the norm. Wonderful. Thanks, Daviani. Over to you, George. Hi everyone, um, I've got a background in artificial intelligence. I work um, leading future work for Willis Towns Watson, which is a consulting company working very closely with businesses as they are rethinking and redesigning work. So I'm very close, if you like, to where the future begins at the workplace and within the corporation. If I was to make a prediction about the future, I think that work in the future will be determined by the economics of abundance rather than economics of scarcity. And hopefully we'll have a conversation about that later on, but very quickly just to, to make the distinction, 
The economics of abundance say that the more people collaborate, the more value is created, rather than uh, the zero-sum game that we're used to in the economics of scarcity. I would like to expand on this uh, later. I mean, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds fascinating, and we'll definitely make sure we get to it. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm the head of content at a place called the School of Life where we teach uh, emotional intelligence and key emotional skills for the workplace to companies around the world. Uh, and I design our content. And um, my prediction is that we will, for lots of different reasons, see people increasingly choosing to work independently. So they won't just be in the gig economy because they don't have another option. They will choose to work independently. This is a trend that began in 2008 with the last financial crisis um, and has been increasing year year on year percentage wise uh, of the workforce ever since then and one of the things that is most important to people who are surveyed about why they choose to work independently is a feeling of control over their lives their work style and the types of things that they work on so i think a real focus for individual people will be choosing uh, autonomy in the way that they work control over their lives and um, employers will have to adapt uh, to really address this psychological need for their employees and to do that, they're going to have to teach them new ways of working, particularly the kinds of uh, self-management that are needed uh, in independent workers, or otherwise they'll really be in trouble. So that's my prediction. I think we're certainly, certainly on the same page uh, with that one, but nonetheless, four or five very uh, different uh, aspects to uh, our potential working future. Um, jumping right into it and picking up on something that Dev Yarny said, remote working, being here to stay, remote working being now a feature of so many of our lives. I know a lot of us are sort of incrementally going back to work to varying degrees, but James, as our uh, resident uh, real estate expert, I wanted to ask, I mean, is the office as we know it dead or at the very least in decline? I mean, is it, is it changed forever? How do you see our workspaces changing going forward? I think, um, I think that the, the interesting dichotomy is that we've faced is that before, because there was a scarcity, we were in full employment. Um, employers were doing everything they could to attract people and retain staff. It was the number one message we heard from occupiers was how do I retain and attract staff? And they wanted to make their workplaces more domestic. Um, this has flipped that on its head. Uh, and in many ways it's accelerated uh, where we've got to. And I think in that great acceleration, it's, um, it's a it's a really fascinating in, insight to what happens, but I think the key thing is is that if you can create a space that attracts people, uh, that you can create somewhere where they can thrive and they can collaborate. I mean, today uh, we're back in our office for the first time, and I honestly feel that today has been way more productive in the short ten minute conversations I've had with people compared to a world of virtual working. And so it's a mix of those two things. And I think the type of space that successful real estate operators should provide is something that gives a service that makes all people that come to interact with that building. And, and I think that point that Sarah was saying about those independents, they still need to collaborate somewhere. You can collaborate virtually, but you will want to come together at some point to get the message across to understand the values of that organization that you're committing, even if it's one day of consulting to, do they match my values? And does that space in which I can communicate with them still match that too? So I think the death of the old style office is very real, but the opportunities for the new style collaboration spaces is, is tremendously exciting. I mean, to what extent, just two two quick factors on that, and um, I'd like to get uh, yours and, and if possible, a couple of other people's thoughts on this. Firstly, aren't the restrictions that are going to be in place after, and they will be with us for some time, no doubt. I mean, we're not going to go straight back to business as usual, you know, in a, in a COVID world, you know, it's more apt to call it a COVID world rather than a post-COVID world, I'd say. Isn't that going to make it much harder to provide the benefits that supposedly came with having a physical office. I mean, we're not going to be able to interact and socialize in the same way. And well, secondly, and this, and just to the, the other sort of two questions um, on that, on, from a purely economic perspective, is there not going to be 
a massive rollback in terms of investment in physical space simply because companies are you know going to be cutting costs they're going to want to be uh, going to want to be uh, really really making sure their margins are as big as possible and real estate is a good way to do that now that we've got so many remotely enabled workers yeah but i mean i think in, in, if you look at the cost of real estate relative to any company's organization even in central london or manhattan or any major business center at most it was 10 percent of total cost of revenue so you could roll back and you could save some cost uh, i don't fully believe that that any organization can survive without a physical uh, space to come together. So at best, you're gonna save 5% of cost and that's attractive, but I think you lose so much more interaction. And today, even at two meters social distancing uh, with uh, 20 of my colleagues that have been in the office today, it has been so uh, so exciting. So you know, we've, we've generated new ideas that just were not being generated in that virtual world and um, I think that once you get into the hybrid world of half people in the office and half people not the FOMO the fear of missing out on that experience the lack of communication will still be the drive towards wanting to come together um, so I, I think the, the future is possible in that in that COVID, COVID managed world we just haven't designed the final solutions yet and we'll, we will get there Deviani, moving on to you very quickly, talking about this new, this new sort of working situation that we find ourselves in, talking, you know, moving things a little bit more towards that um, remote side of things. What are some of the challenges that we're already seeing in having a fully functioning workplace now in the, in the future of work in a post-COVID world with all the things that come with it, be they rem uh, remote working and also some of the other technologies coming into play? So uh, I guess uh, I would disagree slightly with James in terms of, you know, uh, the, the scenario where uh, everyone is really keen on getting back to work, because I think there are two aspects here. The safety issue is still very real and will continue for some time, and that is going to deter a lot of people. I think the second is it also depends on individuals. There are people who prefer being with others, and there are others who've found that this is actually a great way for them, uh, along with the work-life balance. So I think we, the, you know, from what I've been listening to senior leaders, uh, the fact is you are going to have both kinds of scenarios, but I think employees now will have a much greater say in terms of what happens rather than the organization deciding it for them. Uh, but clearly technology is going to play a very big role. As you know, we've seen the uh, AI and digital solutions have been around for a for for the last few years, but the uptake now that they're getting has been has been at a, at a very different scale. And I think once people start using it, along with the cost factor, uh, but the ease with which you can get insights and analytics, which really helps managers manage remote teams in a very different way, technology will become a big driver now as compared to the last couple of years. Hmm. I mean, that's that, that's very interesting. I mean, sort of with that, with that in mind, I mean, are, are we seeing a shift in the, in the way people are being managed because of the introduction of those technologies and because of the limitations that we have right now? I mean, what are, I mean, you know, you can't see who, how people are working now. Like you can't, you know, be in front of them every day. I mean, how is that impacting the way that companies are organized and how basically people are being supervised? So I think we're still going through a bit of a transition. I think, you know, when, when the crisis happened, people were in reactive mode. And I think they are beginning to settle down, but it's still very much adapting. And, and, and now uh, quite a few organizations have started thinking ahead. So clearly the use of technology has been necessitated by the crisis, but I think the cost factor is going to be big. So if you look at, uh, from an investment perspective, firstly, the investment in technology has been going up, you know, uh, even before the crisis in the first quarter of 2020, over a billion dollars were already, already invested in HR tech. And, and over the last 13 quarters, it has seen a quarter and quarter increase. So I think even before the crisis, the trend was an accelerated use of, H, of technology around people management of future of work. But the crisis is clearly changing things. Um, and I can go into details if we have time, but if you look at the basics, even talent acquisition, the shift towards virtual assessment, virtual interviewing, virtual onboarding has gone up. And once people realize that it's actually not all that difficult, 
you will see an increased use around it. Wellness is a big area. I mean, whether it's physical wellness, mental wellness is huge, uh, but also financial wellness. And again, the use of technology to help people manage some of these issues has gone up dramatically. Uh, learning and upskilling is another area. I think uh, classroom training was really still very traditionally used, whereas now people have realized that the use of AI-based and technology solutions to upskill people and to give them more of a choice is, is, is indeed a big advantage. Uh, so as I said, if you look at every aspect of the employee life cycle, there is an opportunity. It's the mindset which has been the issue till now. I mean, I, I mean that, that sort of takes me on to, to, to you, Sarah, in quite, in, in quite a, a, an interesting um, and timely way. So with that in mind, what do we need to be doing to manage people effectively right now? How can we empower employees? I mean, you are very much the panel's expert on how to be happy and emotionally intelligent and fulfill that work. I mean, how do we do that now, especially when everyone's feeling so disrupted and so despondent? What is the crisis? Yeah, for? I think that's a great question. It's really important. And we can see that it's on the minds of many of our clients uh, recently, because if one thinks about the sort of vast history of work, there was an enormous period of time where management was, you know, extremely authoritarian, top-down style um, stuff. And it worked reasonably well, especially when people were uh, in factories or doing manual tasks. And then we had this shift towards this sort of focus on the psychology of the worker, especially in the 20, 20th century. And now, of course, in the 21st, as people began to work with their minds, there was recognition that, you know, as people worked with their brains, um, it really mattered what their mental state was. And... Um, and increasingly, I would say that uh, that is one of the most important things people can do to encourage productivity and creativity. They have to help the employees' minds. And there are, of course, little tweaks that you can do uh, to, to help with this. People, people spend a lot of time thinking about the office space or um, you know, a wellness program here or there that gives them some yoga. And, and these things are quite lovely. But um, one of the most important things I think is to help people cultivate the skills that will allow them to manage themselves because actually management really tends to demotivate people. People tend to leave managers rather than jobs. It's very difficult for managers to do their job well. So if both people who are managers and people who are being managed develop the skills of self-management, things go a lot better. Um, and I mean here skills like resilience, the ability to cope with stress, something we've seen uh, be enormously important during this crisis. Also skills like decision-making. Decision-making takes up a lot of our cognitive space day to day, and it's very stressful for people. We know that people get exhausted and start making bad decisions, but there are ways that people can begin to manage this challenge psychologically. So that's something we teach at the School of Life, for example. Um, and you know, communication skills, because most work is highly collaborative now, and um, it's not something that's often formally taught in school. So oddly, we get trained for years and years in, in formal education, in, in kind of these factual areas and what people really need to be able to do now in work a lot of the time is is manage their own emotions and their relationships with other people um, and i would say that um, the most effective way of keeping people going especially in such uncertain times is to teach them these kinds of skills and i think that's the kind of management style and the kind of emphasis in general uh, in hr that we'll hopefully see because i think the other options the the, the huge surveillance teams um, or the, the ai tracking are both uh, not I would say necessarily ethical most of the time, but also less effective in the long run. I think they're demoralizing. Yeah, I mean, although, yeah, I mean, it certainly does sound like the best way to go. Although, of course, some certain certain corporate megaliths who we won't name right now are definitely pursuing the uh, tighter, tighter surveillance. <laughs> yeah, approach. yeah, we've um, got to show them. <laughs> we we talked about uh, major corporations rationalizing um, their expenditure um, when it comes to footprint and. Uh, Deviani has talked about the investments being made in, in HR and in uh, other technologies across the board, which, which leads us over to you, George. And really one of the, the big questions that I know um, lots of people are, are here and very interested to, to discuss today. Um, obviously, when a depression comes along and a crisis comes along, there's normally a lot of automation anxiety. People are worried about their jobs being automated as companies look to improve efficiencies by investing in technologies. Are we seeing that? already? Are we seeing companies automating through AI? Are we seeing those big ticket investments that look to threaten quite a lot of jobs? Absolutely. I think what we see, what COVID-19 did was really accelerate the journey towards automation. It accelerated this journey massively, I would say. 
and uh, given the, um, the economic pressures that the pandemic ha has caused, uh, especially the lockdowns uh, on companies, uh, automating processes and automating and you know, getting efficiencies out of automation has is, is, is become top of mind. So um, I think automation is a great thing as long as the boundary of automation is shared uh, more equitably, let's say, in society. But it is a, not such a good thing when the boundary of automation um, is, um, goes straight into a, a minority of people. And I think it's more of a, a social and political issue, uh, the discussion around automation and the merit of automation, rather than a business issue. From a business perspective, it makes perfect sense, absolutely. Uh, in, the, in the current sort of, you know, world that we live in, the purpose of a business is to maximize uh, its, its, uh, its, its equity, right? Its uh, return on, on, on investment for the, you know, and the value it returns to shareholders. That is the goal. Uh, you may hear, you know, uh, top bosses talking about social purpose and social purpose is very much important in terms of, you know, making sure that customers are happy. But deep inside, you know, the, the, the heart of corporation beats for one goal only, one purpose only which is to you know, create profits, as much profit as possible, okay? Um, so we need to think of automation both in terms of, you know, we have to look at it from different angles, let's put it this way, right? From the angle from within the, 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 uh, the corporation, the, it's very clear. But from the angle of society and politics at large, I think we, it merits a much greater debate and it's not black and white, if that makes sense, okay? No, I mean, ab absolutely, and, and I suppose with that, uh, with, with that sort of socio-political context in mind, I mean, are there any sort of policy or social solutions that you would think would be uh, would, would be able to, in some way, uh, mitigate the uh, sort of inequality aggravating or you know the, the concentration of the bounty that you think are being should be seriously considered right now? I think there is. I think there is. Obviously, this is a huge conversation, but let me just throw a few pointers there. Perhaps we can explore. There is something new about uh, the uh, so-called AI economy or the data economy, something that is quite different from, uh, you know, the previous industrial revolutions, which were based on resources that were quite limited, okay? There was scarcity of resources. So, for example, you know, oil is scarce, right, to drive, you know, manufacturing, uh, transportation, and so on. So you had, you know, those resources were, the, were quite scarce. And everything was built around maximizing what is called efficiency, right? And efficiency is all about, you know, making sure that the scarce resources that you have are being deployed in the most efficient way in order to maximize outcomes. What's interesting about the fourth industrial revolution is that the resource, the main resource is data, okay? And this is a really interesting resource because it's not scarce. You know, I mentioned before, you know, the concept of abundance. Uh, data is not scarce. In fact, it has the opposite of scarcity, meaning that the more open you are with your data, the less you try to prevent other people from sharing it and using it, i.e. the more you share data and you combine data, the more value you create, okay? So I think this is a unique characteristic of the fourth industrial revolution that uh, requires a lot more thinking and reflection of what, that, what can that do to the way capitalism works, okay? For instance, um, there are already ideas, you know, coming from the 20th century, like cooperatives or mutual ownership or organizations, right? That they were, you know, very good businesses, you know, they, they contribute, you know, a big percentage of the global GDP already. But they are different from your usual corporations. Now, if we can imagine those uh, businesses, the way they govern themselves, the way they have social purpose as part of their charter, Indeed, yeah. And if we can imagine such sort of cooperatives in the future of data and the future of AI, then perhaps we can see a path forward whereby the value created by the data doesn't go straight into the pockets of a minority of shareholders that sit on the board or, you know, uh, like, you know, Apple or Google or somebody else, but it, it spreads more evenly. So maybe one way of doing it is, is this way. Um, there are, you know, a bunch of economists that are thinking about policies, about robot tax, UBI, et cetera, et cetera. We can discuss all that as well. But I think we need many ideas, both from top down, but also from bottom up, from, from how wealth will be created, if you like, in the AI economy of the 21st century. Absolutely. I mean, certainly, certainly an interesting thought, and I agree that 
you know, there are no certainly no no bad ideas right now, and that cooperative approach is certainly <coughs> certainly an interesting one in, in the data economy. I actually wanted to throw it to to you, Sarah, with regard to what some of you think some of those potential solutions might be as we move into this age and this new economic economic period of potentially concentration of, of wealth and power and so on in, in the hands of um, a few different entities and indeed any other thoughts you have on social and political arrangements that we should look at moving forward um well obviously i don't i don't have views as the school of life on these things but i would say that i think um it will really depend on how people how people act politically and that's not not set in stone yet so if people organize if they go on strike as we saw there was a major strike with sort of instacart workers spread outwards in america um, we could see a really different model than if people don't. And that's like all politics, sort of a choice. One has to um, see how it goes. I think uh, certainly one of the things that is going to become important is whether, um, whether governments allow people to organize and whether they regulate how they can contact their fellow workers. So one of the things that's quite, quite clear is a lot of gig workers don't even know where their other workers are, right? They, they wouldn't know who to organize with. Um, so I know there's a movement right now in this country to allow workers to contact each other on company email to do union style organization. Um, that's one answer. I think the other answer is, is really going to be about uh, how, how much human skills are vital. Because if, if some of the things human beings do that computers can't do or that we don't want computers to do are still very vital, then people have essentially negotiating power at the table against uh, the people who hold capital. And I think the third, the third thing is just how stable our governments and our uh, economies are going to be. I don't think they've uh, shown a, a great amount of stability and recovery potential yet in this crisis. And if we see a series of crises like this, which is not unlikely given what we know about the likelihood of future epidemics, the likelihood of massive disruption due to climate change and so on, then it may be that all of our working assumptions about who has power and who has money end up dissipating uh with political unrest so i would always say putting aside every other all the other sort of big headline political beliefs that i hold that even those who maybe are shareholders or who own companies or you know who, who would be most motivated to keep wealth concentrated at the top um have an interest in trying to maintain a society where uh where there isn't massive political disruption and in order to do that, I think the only way is to, to really look at this problem of inequality and address it in a serious way, not just in the way that talking heads at Davos pretend to. Hopefully that rant didn't silence <laughs> Ken. I don't know if he's, or Ben. Just, <clears throat> but just from the frozen picture, then I think uh, ah, there's a, maybe oh. maybe one of you has a thought on this as well. Though I'm curious. Can, while can, we wait. I, can I just okay, I, you know very interesting thoughts, and I just wanted to I guess pick up a couple of things you said, Sarah, and you said George. Um, you know, two things. Firstly, I think clearly you need automation that is human centric. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And Sarah, I think you made two interesting points. The first was the different skill sets that's going to be needed now. I mean, starting with, you know, leaders, I think leaders have to be far more empathetic and they've had a very tough balancing act on one hand. I think they've had to make very quick decisions, but they've also had to do it. They've had to do it in a very sensitive way. And that's needed a very different leadership style than the traditional command and control that most traditional businesses, business leaders have had. And similarly, I think managers or team leaders or, you know, whatever you may call it, but people who manage teams, uh, clearly have had to ensure that in spite of remote working, in spite of the uncertainty, they provide the level of support, counseling, coaching to teams, and therefore the emphasis on soft skills and what used to be the soft skills and are now the hard skills yeah. uh, <laughs> up, has, yeah. has gone up dramatically and will continue to do so in the future. So I think in terms of skills for the future, I would say you know, the emotional quotient of leaders needs to be far higher than it has been in the past. Uh, and then the second issue that you've raised about, uh, you know, upskilling that's going to be needed for everyone. And traditionally, I think people have relied on the government or not-for-profit and corporates have shirked away from that. But I do think, 
increasingly corporates will have to step in and take far more accountability and responsibility, particularly given, I think, the economic uncertainty that's going to happen over the next few years. I totally agree. And I would just add, you know, that I think um, maybe because we're living in such a politically uncertain time in so many ways, my, my feeling, having listened to many, many people go through workplace training, looking at lots of data, is that people have very high... Um, filters for nonsense. I'll not swear on the panel, but you know, they, they, they're kind of, uh, they don't want to be told the story. And so what I tend to emphasize in the way that I design uh, training for people who are managers is that if you're living in an uncertain time, the best thing you can do for the people you manage is be honest about that. And I think that for a long time, management theories have kind of said, you know, keep, keep everything feeling stable, try to reduce people's level of anxiety, um, kind of hold on to certainties. And, and, you know, I, I think there are not that many certainties that any company can give right now about the state of the world. So I think there's got to be kind of a new angle on these soft skills that has mm. to do with honesty and openness and willingness to say, I also don't know what's happening. But the upside of that style of management is that people recognize that it's, um, it's not a story, so to speak. And I think, um, yeah. and I, sorry, just to add to that point, I couldn't, I was just Thanks. thinking from our own experience, uh, thankfully, three or four years ago, we got to that point of training about having open and honest conversations, how to confront issues, how to be open about it. We created a, a series of values in the culture that is very real and easy for us to understand. So to cope with this uncertainty has been much easier for us to, to put into place. And I think um, the, the interesting part of that is the, which, the way in which the way that workplaces can facilitate that to happen, but they are, they all come as a package. And what I slightly worry about is if it is entirely remote, that I don't know that you can build that culture. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you to sort of understand how you embed that those cultures and values in people that are disparate and in lots of different places. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big challenge, and I wouldn't I wouldn't pretend that we've yet in the two months of the crisis figured out every aspect of this. Um, we're actually working to develop some new new virtual products right now. And, and that sounds very wonky, but I mean, uh, techniques for getting companies who are necessarily far flung at this point, the, the employees are all remote to connect with one another. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's very true. There are all kinds of reasons why virtual communication is, is sort of stunted in some elements. We can't read body language. We can't make direct eye contact. There's a lot of evidence that really helps. Um, but I do think there are still things people can do and, and so in some ways, the virtual format also requires this clarity because it doesn't allow us to do things at the sort of unconscious level that nonverbal communication tends to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's things like really making routine the way that you communicate and setting clear sort of, I will tell you every Tuesday about X and then really doing it. Things like reliability in that way end up having a lot more of an influence. Um, I would also say that I think, um, you know, people are going to become a lot more sensitive to the differences in how people communicate because people have really different sort of views on what kind of online communication works for them. So we're going to have to become aware of the sort of diversity of uh, human preferences. And I actually think this is really overdue. Um, we've been not terribly uh, fast to, to adapt to the, the many divergent kinds of minds in the world in terms of disability. And I think that the online format forces us to realize like, right, in my team, there are six people, which means there are six different preferences for communication. And I'm going to have to really think through and be conscientious about that now that we don't have one room that we're all sitting in. So, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. And um, I don't think we've yet figured out the perfect standard, but I do think that some things about this format will um, hopefully help really dedicated managers and companies rethink communication and trust. Uh, thanks, guys. Sorry, I was ironically laid low by um, a technology and communications failure on my uh, infrastructure over here. I'm sorry, Deviani, were you just about to jump in there? No, no, that's fine. I hadn't realized you, were, you had joined. And so I really yeah. wanted to ask George about the jobs uh, of tomorrow and what does he think is going to happen. So, but over to you. Yeah, uh, yeah well, sorry, over to you, George. I was actually going to ask something similar. This time of uncertainty. Honestly, which which jobs do you see being uh, which jobs do you see never coming back? I think is probably one of the biggest things. And also, people talk a lot about AI not uh, AI and automation not so much replacing jobs, but it being more of a symbiosis um, between um, man and machine. And to Deviani's point, 
you know, what do the jobs of tomorrow look like from your perspective? So I think that, you know, if history is any guide, um, what we've seen in previous industrial revolutions or indeed in instances where uh, some kind of technology came in to disrupt the workplace, what we've seen clearly is a phenomenon called the hollowing out of jobs. And um, it's reasonable to expect something similar to happen. So let me explain what that is and then I'll sort of build the argument. So holding out of jobs means that you have many jobs that are you know, present in the labor market but require very low skills. And then you have many jobs as well in, present in the labor market that require very high specialized skills, but nothing in between. So what happens with technology? Usually what they, it automates the middle, mid-skilled jobs. Like typical example would be manufacturing jobs, right? Ma manufacturing jobs and sort of medium skilled job, medium level, medium pay. So all those jobs are going away. For instance, when I hear about, you know, countries like the US and others saying we're going to onshore manufacturing, onshore manufacturing will happen, but it's going to be fully automated. It's not going to be any jobs, any net uh, sort of increase in jobs. So if that, I think we should expect something similar to happen with AI. So everybody will be working with some kind of AI, right? Even the people that do low level jobs will be working with some kind of AI. But low level, low skill and low paid jobs will be a plenty. Okay, simply because there are so many physical jobs that it really doesn't make sense to have robots do it. Uh, so humans can do it. And then you will have some very sort of, you know, sophisticated jobs that, and highly paid jobs that, uh, you know, people will be working, your know, experts will be working closely with highly intelligent AIs, it will be like a symbiosis. But the worrying thing is there will be nothing in between. So, I think this is the main concern of economists when they look into the fourth industrial revolution and they're thinking of what's, a, what's so-called the displacement effect, right? And what, the, you know, the, 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 the thing that makes them afraid and makes me afraid as well is that although AI will create new, new jobs, definitely, those new jobs will require high skills, okay? And a high level of intelligence and, and sort of, you know, a, sort of a certain personality that, you know, it's there in the society, but it's not there in abundance. So the big question is what's gonna to happen to the majority of people, okay? I, I worked with a client once who automated um, a big part of their infrastructure and gave the choice to uh, its people who were up to that point doing physical jobs to retrain themselves and become, if you like, trainers of AI algorithms, okay? Sit in front of, uh, you know, visual, data visualizations and train the algorithm. And one of the workers came up to me and said, you know, George, I didn't go to school, not because I, I didn't have the opportunity to go to school. I, I, I didn't go to school, you know, I didn't go to college because that's the, what, that's the life I wanted for me, right? I don't want to study, I don't want to reskill myself. So we must also factor into our minds that there, there are in lots of people out there who it's their right, you know, and their choice not to reskill themselves. So what's going to happen to them? I think these are big questions. And although reskilling and all those policies, you know, will soften the impact, I think the, the big impact of AI is, is much bigger than can be softened by just reskilling the workforce. You know, and that, that's my fear. With that, with that in mind then, uh, and that hollowing out, uh, and also demographic shifts that are going on in certain Western countries as well, of people getting beyond a lot of uh, working ages. I mean, is it now time for something like universal basic income? Is that a solution? You're asking me? Uh, yes, for now, and then I'm going to move on to everyone else. I think okay. I've got opinion on this one. Let me give my opinion, and I'm sure others will do as well. So I'm personally not convinced by UBI for a number of reasons. One is that I don't think there's uh, still evidence from experiments so far that it really makes any difference. Now, if in terms of, you know, solving any, any, any problems uh, in society, the second thing that worries me about UBI is that it makes people even more dependent on the government and the state, i.e. it extends the welfare system to almost you know, everybody universally. And I'm quite skeptical of that for all kinds of reasons. The third uh, reason that I'm definitely against, well, kind of against the UBI is that it gets a lot of support from uh, you know, bankers and uh, high tech executives. And I, this gets me a little bit suspicious, if you like. I think that what's behind this, you know, exclamation of, um, you know, support for UBI by those guys is that they want to continue with business as usual and have those externalities of automation paid by the government and social welfare. So they don't want to take this responsibility. So I'm generally very skeptical of UBI. It seems to me like a lazy way 
to think of the future. I would, I would, I would prefer us to look into more radical ways of, of changing things. Wow, interesting. We'll hopefully touch, get a chance to touch on those a little yeah, later on. Uh, <laughs> Devyani, thoughts on UBI? Well, not UBI, but actually going back to what George was talking about earlier, the impact of AI and jobs. I think the other angle, particularly since we've also touched on societal uh, impact is, you know, there was a recent study done by Pricewaterhouse of 29 countries, and this is before the crisis, but the impact of AI on jobs. Um, and uh, I guess it's, it's uh, unsurprisingly, the, the least level of impact was really in countries such as South Korea, Singapore, Japan, where the level of automation is already pretty high. And the highest level of impact was in countries where this predominantly uh, manufacturing or low skill level physical kind of industries. Um, and countries like the UK probably were in between also because they have a fairly good balance of the service sector versus the industrial sector. So I think there is a, a wider implication, particularly now given the crisis uh, of, of, of uh, you know, what technology could do, could damage, but also what governments could be more proactive around trying to ensure upskilling happens. And irrespective, I think we can't stop the march of uh, digitalization. Um, you know, just uh, in, in the last one week, I've had conversations with two businesses in the oil and gas industry, which as you know, have been particularly hit. And of course, we've read about BP yesterday, where 10,000 jobs have been declared as you know, and, and the people costs are 8 billion as compared to uh, the total operating cost of 32 billion. So roughly 33% of the cost of people cost. Now, in given the next couple of years and the kind of economic pressures businesses are going to face on one hand, there will be uh, an even increasing tendency to, um, I guess, make pe people redundant for, for lack of a better word and not invest in upskilling them enough. So again, I go back to saying, I think, uh, and, and the other conversation is really with another oil services company whose key st business strategy now is going to be digital, which means every employee in the business will need digital skills. And that's, that's similar to what George was saying. Uh, so I think AI, digital, upskilling around that is inevitable. Um, and how each business does it, to what extent it does it, and, and how strategically it does it, will in, in a way be a measure of how successful they're going to be over the next few years. Sure, sure. James, I, I'm not going to say UBI just because actually to Deviani's point, you know, there's a bigger question here about how to respond to the ongoing disruption. Um, your thoughts on that, both, let's stick from a, uh, from a sort of political, social provision perspective for the time being. I mean, how yeah. can we cope with this mass unemployment, with this immense job market disruption going on? Big, and this is where I think the human aspect comes into it, because, and, I'm, and I'm biased towards an urban uh, viewpoint, uh, because I live, work, and enjoy being in that city. I think, the, uh, I think if you were to look at the skyline of London today, I think if you look at it in 10 years time, I think it's going to look pretty similar. I don't think it's going to look radically different. Uh, and the reason for that is that I think that uh, the one element we haven't discussed here because it's not the right topic, but we discussed in the last uh, panel was about sustainability and how important the effect of climate change is on people. And I think that the understanding about how much embedded carbon real estate consumes and therefore we will be trying to shape to make the most of what we have uh, and how we make that more efficient. And that, that also means that some things like Brent Cross Shopping Centre probably will be repurposed. Uh, a lot of high streets, a lot of Oxford Street will be repurposed in a way, but it, it's only of value if you are bringing the community with you. How uh, an effective ESG policy and that and genuinely looks to for corporate organisations to help improve uh, the social benefit of the community that surrounds your location, uh, I think is going to become uh, an increasing attractor to em em employing or even temporarily using staff, uh, and also to be seen as your brand value and how you are associated and the effect you have uh, on the uh, global footprint. So sure. yeah. I think it's going to be a very so, different aspect. Yeah, well, so certainly also another way to do that aligning of um, a company with, with purpose as well, which we know is becoming so important 
um, for attracting employees, but also for you know social legitimacy going forward. Sarah, I wanted to come to you on that question of, I mean, you can take it as a UBI or a broader question about how uh, governments and economic policy can respond to the potential joblessness and economic disruption that we're going to see going forward. I mean, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'm really curious what George would say, because I, I love the radical <laughs> solution. So, but um, I would say, I guess, that, you know, it's very important to not kind of take terms for granted and I think uh, there are many 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 different things that could kind of fall under the umbrella of UBI um, mm. and and I, and, I, and I think also sort of the whole framework of UBI is is um, really depends on who's putting it forwards right so uh, there's in the same way that you could talk about a wealth tax right I'm I'm pro wealth taxes in general but you can do a wealth tax in a in a, in a poor way and then all the capital flight happens out of the country and it causes a lot of disruption. That's just my politics. But um, in the same way, I would say there are many different things that provide people with an income regardless of whether they're in formal employment. We could think about, for example, um, massively increasing public services or um, thinking again about the logic of the commons rather than private property. I mean, for, for hundreds of years of human history, there were certain natural resources, areas of land, et cetera, that were owned in community, sort of as the community owned them rather than individual people. Um, and that provided effectively a very baseline way of, of subsisting. And one of the reasons now that things are so precarious is that we really don't have commons like this anymore. The fencing off of the forests in England, for example, made this huge radical change in people's lives because even if they were extremely impoverished, they could go into the forest, forage, and, and, and sort of subsist. Um, and we even see this in the Bible, the, the Jubilee years are really a sort of cultural, political solution to certain forms of poverty by saying, you know, every seventh year there's a redistribution and certain things are available for anyone who needs them. And, and I would say, you know, this is just to say that the UBI doesn't have to be one, one thing or another, it doesn't have to be distributed through the state necessarily. If some things are taken out of the realm of private property, again, it can become managed in many different ways. Um, we actually see this with the growth of mutual aid groups around this uh, country. Mutual aid groups tend not to own any property, but they, they just supply what people need without gating those resources um, and they own them in common. And, and, you know, obviously this is just a model that, that works for certain things. But I would just say that if we're going to have radical solutions, I think it means rethinking the concept of property as such. And um, it doesn't have to look like the state based capitalist systems that we've had for the last hundred years. Uh, it's certainly, certainly a radical, radical solution. One thing really quickly, I have uh, one question for all of you at the end, but George, sorry, radical but solution. <laughs> can, can I very quickly uh, respond to what Sarah said, because she said some, some very good ideas, some ideas yeah. that I would like to discuss also. But let me just very quickly uh, make a sort of emphasize the, the, the concept of the commons, because I think this is an amazing co concept that we should definitely rethink. Uh, and think of data commons, okay? Data Commons is a huge, huge, huge opportunity here to really, you know, rethink capitalism. Why? Because data is the new oil. Data is, will drive wealth in the economy for the next, you know, next few decades. And we are all, you know, we are the ones that contribute data to this, to the creation of this value, right? And yet, we don't get any, anything in return, if you like. Okay, all the value that is extracted by aggregating our data, whether it's, you know, a Google search engine or something like that, goes to someone else. So if we can rethink data commons, then there are structures to rethink how data commons can become value creating and return value to the, to the, to the, to the ones that contribute the data, for example, data trusts. Okay, then that will be a good pointer to the future. And just one more thought about data commons and commons in general. Although I do believe in, in private property, and I think, you know, if you look into uh, some of the ideas that Eleanor Ostrom, uh, the Nobel laureate, the only woman actually that got Nobel laureate so far, uh, has around, you know, the management of the commons and how communities can own the commons, right? Can own the commons and co-manage the commons and get value from the commons. I think that is a great, I don't know, economic theory that we can use and apply uh, for the AI economy of the 21st century. I mean, this is, as predicted, this conversation has touched on so many different things. I'm going to uh, throw it open to the Q&A in just one second, because there are some really interesting ones um, coming up uh, in my little, my little tab here. Um, but quickly, I wanted to run all of you, honestly, a two-sentence answer, if possible, keep it to one if you can. What skills would you learn right now to future-proof your career? 
what skills would you advise your children to learn your friends to learn what should you be studying right now or how should you be studying right now in order to prepare yourself for the future of work i'll start with you sarah okay great <laughs> i would say the first thing is to to learn communication skills and i don't just mean sort of the the trite things you might learn in an elocution class but also look at the psychology of how people learn that's the thing i study in great detail learn about how many concepts people can keep in their working memory at once the kinds of emotions that tend to anchor people's understanding of concepts and um, practice doing it online and film yourselves i'm currently teaching this uh, to a bunch of students as a trial class and and actually this is one of the best things people can do learn the new format uh, of communication oh. and, yeah I want to make sure people have time for Q&A, so I've really got to wrap right, up you right thing. now. And to be honest, concise is good for this, you know, straight on the money. Deviani, what would you like? Um, I would say a combination of digital and creative, so both left and right brain. Love it. James? Develop your emotional intelligence. Good answer. George? Learn to collaborate and be a team player. These are all great answers, although I think there is a common thread going throughout. I mean, no one said like STEM or anything, so you know, it's good to know. Um, okay, wonderful. I'm, I think uh, we are running a little bit over, but hopefully if the panelists don't mind, they'll be able to stay for a few minutes over to do the Q&A. Um, Jerome? Fantastic. What an incredible conversation. I'm not surprised we've been running over with this, that everyone wants to kind of share thoughts on each other and build on top of things. Um, I want to start with a really strong question from Alex, and this is um, in the segue towards the social impact um, of AI and automation. What do the panel think that governments should be doing uh, to kind of deal with the auto impact of automation and AI into the future? Uh, and I was actually really curious to direct that towards Devyani, having kind of previously spent 25 years um, as an HR director and got that kind of a perspective. What's your view on what governments should be doing um, to deal with this? Uh, well, I think they should be investing and focusing on upskilling in a much, much bigger way. I think what they do is be reactive. And of course, the current crisis needs some economic support. But the real future is if people get upskilled uh, and supported around that. And I don't think enough of that is happening. Okay. Yeah, I really see that. Yeah. Um, another question from Sam that was kind of answered in the Q&A, but it's definitely worth checking out. Um, George, um, we're looking at a question, taking today the, as a baseline, how much change should we expect in the next one years, five years, 10 years? Um, what do you think are the biggest changes that are going to happen? How quickly will it accelerate? Ah, oh, right. Very broad question. Okay. So, okay, from the perspective of artificial intelligence, what we have right now is, um, some sort of algorithms and technologies that essentially what they do is they do pattern recognition. Okay, they, we have machines that can automate a lot of the things that the brain does when it, our brain perceives things. Okay, what we're lacking in artificial intelligence is machines that can make inferences. Okay, uh, can process information and have, you know, create logical conclusions and essentially be creative in, in, in the human sense of the word, right? Uh, start from something specific, you know, have inductive reasoning, for example. In order to get there, we need a technology called general artificial intelligence, okay? Now, there's billions and billions of dollars currently invested by all the big players in cracking that problem of general artificial intelligence, and maybe we, we need one call just for that. But those guys that are working on this field right now think that we will have the first results in the next five to, to seven years. So it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Okay, fantastic. So um, another question that we've got come in, um, which is uh, how do we build a benefits framework that can follow workers? Um, we've got the US has been really highlighted to have failed at that with the recent crisis that's come in. Um, I'm actually going to open that to anybody who wants to dive in on benefits frameworks that can follow workers closely. Would someone like to dive in on that one? I can say something really briefly. Um, benefits are important. I, I think workers should generally be compensated better and more creatively than they are right now. But again, there's a lot of research that after a certain level of um, remuneration or provision of other benefits, what people prefer is control over their lives. Um, there's a really interesting book by Frederick Laloux on this, where he looks at horizontal companies and he argues actually alongside, I think someone named Daniel Pink, a psychologist that people after a certain level stop preferring raises to other forms of, 
of control. Um, and, and so I would just encourage people to think very broadly about what it means to be a good employer. Definitely, you should provide, you know, healthcare and, 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 and high wages and so on, in my view, but um, really look at what else employer, employees are looking for. And a lot of that has to do with the ability to make decisions. When am I going to do this task? How am I going to do it? You know, how, how, when do I get to work? When do I get off work? Do I have to commute, et cetera? Especially now when people are not used to being in their homes. Fantastic. And you mentioned well, a book, that, what was the name? The it's audience? called Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lalu. It's a little hippy dippy, but there's lots of nice data. So might be worth looking at. And I think Daniel Book's, um, sorry, Daniel Pink's book on Drive is a really interesting study as well. Great stuff, thank you. Another question, this one's towards James actually. Um, so do you have any examples of companies that have already made that shift from a, a central organized, uh, from a central office space um, to working collaboratively um, and, and doing that in a really effective um, way? Yeah, I think um, I, a lot of people would point towards tech companies early on. So the big Facebook, Google, et cetera. But actually what they were trying to do was to uh, in many ways like Victoria Miller and this bring everybody into the workplace and never leave. They controlled every aspect of your life. I think the more interesting examples are actually there's people like the big four accountants who've uh, tried as a cost base to, to make their real estate as efficient as possible. Um, and I also think that a lot of examples in Australia, uh, because there's a general uh, talent moving out of the country, it's a much more open and collaborative culture. And so some of the things like National Australia Bank or Macquarie are actually really incredible buildings to go to and they don't look and feel like offices. They feel like uh, centres that you want to go to to enjoy that collaboration. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to weave in one, one question of my own here and, and, and actually ask kind of George uh, about this kind of economy of abundance, just because I really wanted to hear a little bit more about it first. Um, and I wanted to frame it as what what why do we have the structure that we currently have? What is it that we're fighting against in order to build this economy of abundance into the future? So the, I think the best way to think about that and start thinking you know, outside the box of the, the economics of scarcity is that in economics, we, we speak a lot about competition, right? That's what it is. Competition is what drives innovation. Competition is what drives wealth. You know, we're talking about sort of the creative destruction of capitalism. These are the concepts we use in order to understand how the economy is, uh, works. And that defines and that determines the relationship between capital and, and labor, okay? And, and, you know, and everything else. So once you start having a resource that creates value that is not scarce, and, and that's why I keep referring back into this concept of data, data being the new oil, data driving, you know, all the sort of, you know, the AI algorithms and all the sort of value is going to create out of AI, which comes into trillions and trillions of dollars, okay? This is a special case whereby if you hold on to your data, right, if you, if you think that you can compete better by being, you know, by, 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 by keeping your, your data and not collaborating with others, you're not going to be able to succeed in this economy. In fact, this economy requires the creation of a new kind of economics, if you like, that are based on, on the so-called ecosystems, right? In a, in a more complex relationship, a more sort of, you know, network effects. Uh, and that creates huge, huge opportunities to completely reinvent what people do in those, in those networks, okay? And how we create value into this network. So, so far, we've been creating value in the economy through our work, okay? So, so that create, you know, if you think about that, people are liabilities, right? If I don't work, I'm a liability. Someone has to pay for me. Someone needs to feed me, okay? So the only way I am not a liability anymore is by doing work. But what happens if I lose my job, right? And if we're talking about the future where we, you know, jobs are going to be obsolete or very rare, what we're talking about is like almost everybody becoming a liability. This is a nightmare, okay? So how can we turn this concept of humans being li li liabilities into humans being assets, right? Assets, simply by virtue of us existing and interacting and collaborating. What does that mean in terms of economic value? Sarah mentioned a very, very, very important thing. She mentioned, you know, the importance of social capital, okay? Social capital doesn't really factor in into economic analysis. And yet in the COVID-19, we saw social capital at work, right? And it had huge economic impact, right? All those people that sort of volunteered to help the NHS and everybody else, right? So 
you know, we really need to sort of, you know, get our minds outside the framework of scarcity and outside the, work, the framework of competition and start thinking in terms of collaboration, start thinking about ecosystems, start thinking of humans as assets and start thinking about data aggregation, start thinking about the commons. These are the, new, I would say, these are the new words that we need to start using to help us start thinking in a different way. Yeah, I really resonate with that. Our economy kind of results product, uh, um, rewards productivity or creation as opposed to noticing, understanding, being, these kind of things as well. I, so I, 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 I'd, I'd really quickly like to sort of follow up on that point as well to George's point about social capital. And, and this is something that I was keen to, to talk about with the panel, but we didn't really get time to. I think that we are seeing a fundamental uh, or we'll see how long it lasts, but if we are going to you know, put our money where our mouth is, we should see a fundamental re-evaluation of the way that we uh, value workers and in turn the way that we protect them and the way that we compensate them. Because a lot of the people who we've been clapping on our rooftops are quote-unquote essential workers, are people who we previously called low-skilled workers who afford the very minimal protections um, in terms of their uh, employment status and very minimal compensation by and large. And so I think that one of the things that would be a sort of a real shame in this great reset is if we don't have a reevaluation of, of how we can sort of appropriately value uh, those professions. Because as I mentioned, we're not going to be living in a post-COVID world. Like, you know, these are still going to be essential workers three months, four months, six months from now, to one degree or another. So I think something that's really important to think about is how we're going to change our relationship with those workers in our economy. Absolutely. And, and building on that, my, my neighbor's a doctor and this kind of clap for carers is not so keen on that because actually people are being underpaid for the work that they're doing inside hospitals. They're not being paid for the lunch hour that they're continuing to work. Um, and that really begs the question of, you know, how much of actual understanding is um, welcomed in society um, as opposed to a bit of a kind of transactional interface between different groups and bodies. Uh, well, I'm sure we'd love to kind of like dive into this, this stuff like much, much deeper and, and for hours on end for sure. Um, but I'm going to end with a bit of a round robin question, a kind of two choices question for each of you to answer. Um, and so at this crossroad, if you were to invest in just one thing for your five year strategy, either AI um, and automation or upskilling and remote working um, particularly, um, which one would you invest in heavier? So maybe we'll run through maybe James, then Sarah, then Debiani, then George, and then over to you, Ben, afterwards. Uh, I'd invest oh, upskilling people. Always valuing people has got to be better than valuing AI. Humans, definitely. Yeah, humans. Uh, for me, it's not an either or or. The two definitely go together. So I don't see one or the other. Uh, well, it, you know, you asked us to choose, right? Okay, you gave us a dilemma, okay? So I'm going to be an outlier. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in AI. Fantastic. Thank AI you. AI for good. For good, okay? AI for good, right? I mean, I see the case for it, but I appreciate you being um, willing to stick your neck on the line for that view. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ben. Oh, no, uh, actually, over to Ben, eh? Yeah, I think we'll... <laughs> Really quickly, I just want to say I too would invest in AI, although it's not really for socioeconomic <laughs> reasons. It's more because I really want to see what happens with the general intelligence. Like it's honestly one of the burning questions for me. So um, it's more from a personal curiosity perspective. But yeah, AI. It's a singularity. <laughs> Well, th thanks, Ben, for backing the side of every comic book supervillain um, on, on the planet. Uh, I think <laughs> I, I think we, we were seeing you as an impartial chair throughout the rest of the conversation, but you've shown your cards right at the end. Um, I, I can't thank everyone enough. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion. I think Ben, as he well pointed out at the beginning, uh, as he pointed out, that was a that was an all-you-can-eat buffet of everything that we could table in terms of uh, pertinent issues around future of work. Uh, it is actually, uh, as I mentioned at the start, an appetizer. We're hoping for this to be part of a series. The other thing to mention is, um, as, as many people ask in relation to our events, this, this will actually be recorded and we will be posting the link on YouTube for you to uh, enjoy and re-enjoy at, at, at your leisure. And additionally, we've recorded a series of podcasts with each of the speakers, allowing them to deep dive into some of the core issues uh, that they've tabled today. So I think with that, we're going to stop, stop there. Uh, 
final thank you again to all of our speakers uh, and to Ben for chairing and Jerome for ably um, coordinating our audience Q&A. So thank you very much to all of you. I think we're going to end there. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you. a lot.